thank you and welcome to everyone um, who's still around, who still made it through most of the webinar series. Um, my name is Benjamin Baldick, and I will be going over many of the virus tools available to um, virus researchers across KBase, Cyverse, and IMG VR. Um, so let's get started. Okay, so here we are. Um, this is kind of the path that we've taken over the past quite a few weeks now. Um, last week, we um, listened to the DRAM and the DRAM resolved um, genome inferences. Oh, actually, that was two weeks ago. Um, it was GTDB uh, TK and its methodology. Uh, this week um, is my little part. We're going to take two weeks um, in order to do this, to go over the viral tools. Um, and we'll focus primarily on the cyber infrastructures uh, known as Cybers and KBase. Don't worry, I'll get into those uh, momentarily. And then I'll touch on the IMG VR resources. Um, this is a JGI project um, that seeks to kind of collect and bring all of uh, JGI's viral data, uh, NCBI data in one location so that you can explore and download um, the data sets to use whatever you wanna use. And also we will briefly touch upon the, uh, the OSC, um, Ohio Supercomputer Center. Um, for those of you who um, want to do their research um, at OSC. And then finally, after going through the resources, I will touch upon uh, a few tools that we will be using next week. So I won't go into all of the various tools that are available, mainly because, um, mainly because there's not all the tools on, on these cyber infrastructures. So there's no point going over a lot of them if you're not gonna be able to use them at all. And then next week, we're actually gonna put all of this together. Um, we're gonna use each tool and an actual example data set um, to go through the raw reads, the quality control, all of the processing, and hopefully get some results that you could actually use in a paper. So yeah, that will be, that'll be exciting. So this week, um, we'll go through the, the main stuff. Next week, we'll actually do stuff. So you won't need to have any data with you right now. You won't have to sign up for these resources right now, but you will have an opportunity this week to kind of uh, sign in, sign up and log into Cyverse and KBase and IMG. Um, next week, we'll actually kind of do hands-on stuff. Um, so there's a lot to, to cover, and um, I won't try to belabor the point. We have an OSU Veromics workshop that we offer semi-yearly, mostly yearly. Uh, it's kind of a three-day, all-day intensive event. Um, we have people from around the world come in, and we basically talk about viruses and how to process and analyze and handle them um, in sequencing data. And we also have a in microbial informatics course that we teach here um, at OSU. Actually, there's a small viral section in there that we cover uh, over a period of a couple of weeks as well. Um, but those classes go a little bit more into depth that we're, than we're going to do today. Um, I'm going to try to cover a very broad swath um, and go as deep as I can without um, taking kind of too long. I don't want to have you know, a whole day um, when you've only signed up for an hour or two. So if possible, please utilize the panel for any questions and answers you might have. Um, if there's a, a, a panelist who'd like to interrupt me, that's totally fine. Um, if there's any pressing questions, if, um, uh, or if you do have questions and they don't get answered by the panelist or you'd like me to answer them specifically, um, at the end of the talk, I should have given sufficient time for quest questions and answers. Uh, you'll be able, I'll address those then. So a couple of the goals this week, um, mainly uh, that virus processing isn't microbial processing. Um, you use many of the same tools, um, but 
uh, they are different in very subtle and sometimes very blatant ways. Uh, we'll also discuss the tools available to analyze a viral metagenome. And hopefully at the end of this week, you'll have a better understanding on the tools that you can use in order to do so. And then clearly what platforms are available to run these tools. Um, those are the ones that I've already mentioned earlier. Um, and we'll go into um, how to actually you know, use those platforms um, today. And then finally, how to decide on which platform is best for you and your data. Uh, I hope that by the end of today, you'll be able to come back from using these resources and be able to make a better decision on which one you'd like to use. So first things first, viruses aren't microbe. And um, I know that's kind of an obvious point, um, but a lot of people kind of um, either one, have no idea how to analyze a viral metagenome, and uh, it's just the same as analyzing a viral metagenome. You just have to tweak parameters a bit, um, and you have to look at it from a more virus-centric point of view. But at the same time, um, they're actually quite different. Um, and so you need to think about um, assumptions that have been made for microbes that don't hold true for viruses, and also the fact that a lot of the features, the actual genomic features of viruses make them quite different than microbes and studying them. So one of the big things is that viruses in general are a little harder to study than microbes. Um, there are no universal marker genes in viruses. So unfortunately, we spent a whole um, lecture um, focused on using hallmark genes or marker genes for microbes, 16S genes, um, and no such hallmarks, marker gene, I should say, marker genes exist in viruses. They are what are called hallmark genes, which we'll get into momentarily. Um, you can use those to kind of um, identify um, and organize viruses, but they're not universal and they're only applied to kind of smaller groups of viruses. Traditionally, um, they've only been cultured hosts, or the, at least the viruses that infect um, various hosts have been able to be studied. But since the um, ascent of metagenomics and the past few weeks, um, viruses have been kind of more readily studied. There are pros and cons to metagenomics that we'll get into. Um, but generally, it's so much better that we don't need to culture um, microbial hosts anymore. And that's actually one thing I'm going to mention is that most of the research or most of the tools are um, not really designed for um, eukaryotic viruses, but you can apply many of them to eukaryotes and you know, your mileage is going to vary. And then um, virus impacts are actually seen mainly through their hosts. And so viruses in and of themselves um, aren't always a huge focus of research, um, mainly because you know, they, don't, they don't do a specific process without um, pairing with their hosts, so to speak. So if you have a microbe in the ocean that's providing 50% of um, maybe the oxygen or the air that you breathe, um, you're going to pay far more attention to the viruses that infect that and can affect that kind of um, nutrient cycling. Um, and then also that was touched upon twice, I think, um, during this series is that they can actually have huge impacts on global, uh, global cycles. I know Matt um, in the first week actually touched upon the fact um, that viruses lice, you know, 20 to 40% of all of the ocean's microbes every single day. So effectively speaking, you could say that, you know, you have a new microbial ocean every, you know, three days, so to speak. And then they also impact the actual um, metabolisms of the, of the microbes that they're infecting, kind of creating a virocell. And that, 
you can kind of supercharge a lot of microbes by um, when viruses actually infect them. I won't spend too long on that um, because you know that's a whole you know, viruses 101 um, to study. And so this is the microbial ecogenomics pipeline that we went through, um, uh, what was it? Week five, I think, look at my little, yes, week five. Um, and we follow basically the same ten, uh, type of trend or flow. However, we don't have to worry about uh, binning because you know viruses don't need to be binned. We don't generate mags using viruses. Um, and there's no real bin consolidation step in uh, for viruses. There are something called viral OTUs, and I wanted to get this out of the way um, in the beginning, in that um, viral OTUs are kind of synonymous with a kind of a species rank classific uh, classification uh, level for um, like a particular viral genome. Um, you'll find soon that uh, no assembler can really get really strain level resolution for viruses. Uh, we are inching that way slowly, but um, at the moment, if you're using um, just kind of bulk metagenomic data, or even some bulk viral um, data sets, um, you don't kind of have the same enough resolution in order to get strain levels. Um, and there's a significant amount of effort that you'd have to do in order to prove um, you'd have a specific virus strain, so to speak. Um, and so moving forward, you might hear me accidentally say like viral population or like viral group or um, virus cluster. Um, they should be more appropriately dis, uh, called viral OTUs. And this is a paper published um, a couple of years ago um, Muvig's paper that seeks to identify kind of standards that the community, the viral ecology community can use. Um, and so that we're all basically talking about the same thing. So this is where iVirus kind of comes in. iVirus basically makes virus tools available to, to everyone effectively. It provides apps or tools. So these are I, if people aren't familiar with that, these are software programs, software tools um, that you can use to identify and analyze viral data. We also provide documentation um, because so often um, you hear about a new tool, um, it might be published in a, like a little research note, and then you get to the GitHub or the Bitbucket site and there's um, very little if no documentation. Um, tools that we take and integrate using iVirus um, have documentation of some degree at the very least in order for others to be able to use it. And then we also provide data sets um, to the viral community that we find useful. Um, we don't have a kind of scale that JGI does because we just, you know, a single group, um, but we do try to, you know, contribute where possible. And um, probably most notably, we provide nearly complete viral pipelines. And this is about uh, five or six years ago. We had started a small pipeline using various, uh, a handful of tools on Cyverse that we'll talk about momentarily as well. Um, at the time, you know, this was kind of like the only resource that a lot of viral ecology researchers who didn't have, you know, intense bioinformatic training could use in order to analyze a viral data set. Um, and the past couple of years, a lot of tools have become a little bit more widespread and well-known um, and more researchers have become more bioinformatically minded. Um, and so hopefully um, we've been able to expand that um, to more people. And then finally with these, uh, with documentation, we published many protocols on protocols.io um, there is a group um, that you can go here and use um, protocols.io slash groups slash iVirus. Um, this is one of the um, protocols that we have here. Uh, this is basically applying one of the tools to a viral data set and visualizing the output. Um, it's great because you can have, let's see, my mouse should be 
showing up. Um, uh, comments, questions that you can ask myself um, or the community members, and I try to respond. Um, there's a lot of uh, comments, questions that people have, and it's a little too much for our small group to kind of get to every single one of them. We do try though to be you know, mindful. Um, you can also publish these with DOIs. So if you or someone else wants to use protocols.io, you can actually um, publish them and get a referenceable DOI so you can kind of get credit for your work. Um, you can also version each of these protocols. So um, something that most people don't realize is that once you publish a protocol, um, you might want to update it or you might need to change it in response to um, people's you know, concerns. For example, maybe um, you've optimized your parameters or maybe um, someone pointed out a flaw in your methodology. You know? And what you can do in protocols is just simply update them. And unlike publishing a paper um, and having you know, a, uh, a web link available in a citation and people go to that and you're like, oh, this is, is this the most recent update? If there's no mechanism in order to notify users that there's an update, you might erroneously believe that that's the latest and greatest version. However, with uh, protocols.io, um, you'll actually go to that old link and it will say, hey, there's a new version of this uh, protocol. Do you want to go to it? And so you click on that and it will take you to the latest version. Um, and so I encourage anyone who uh, would like to publish protocols or wants to just check out the protocols that we have. We will be going through um, a couple of these next week. Um, and hopefully there'll actually be a few more published uh, between now and then. Um, you can go and just check that out. It's a great, it's a great resource um, and uh, quite a few labs actually use it. So in the past five or six years, we've come and um, been able to expand the uh, uh, pipeline quite a bit from a handful of tools to um, several dozen. And we've actually incorporated other third-party tools in this pipeline as well, so that um, it's not just tools that iVirus develops and integrates, but we also integrate other people's tools as well, as long as they're kind of free and open source. Um, so that, you know, we make other people's tools more accessible to everyone. Um, there are two kind of components here. If you have an eagle eye, uh, the top half is basically Cybers, and this is the pipeline-ish that we'll be going through next week. And then there's also KBase, which actually didn't um, have any uh, presence in the iVirus uh, manuscript a number of years ago, but now we are on KBase. And so um, fellow uh, DOE uh, users can now use KBase in order to analyze a viral metagenome. And I should have put this here, um, but I actually gave a um, lecture a number of, a couple of months ago um, about going through a viral processing uh, using the same data set that we'll go through next week. Um, and so the, Various steps for analyzing a viral metagenome are pretty similar to microbial. We have uh, quality control of your, you know, your reads. It doesn't matter if they're virus or microbes. Um, we use the exact same, in many cases, tools in order to clean up viral reads as we do microbial. Um, we go through an assembly process that's pretty much the same. We use the same tools. Uh, you've seen here, we've used We've talked about IDBAUD, talked about metaspades and megahit. Um, and I think we've discussed spades, well, old spades and velvet as well. Um, and that's for both for Cyverse and for KBase. Uh, KBase doesn't have nearly as many tools as Cyverse, but um, we'll get into this later. Um, but there are also um, uh, other mechanisms in KBase for you to assemble your data as well. Following assembly, we'd like to assess the quality um, of those contigs and remove any small or low quality 
context for the next step, which is basically the key differentiator between viral and microbial data sets, in that we identify the viruses using a ever-growing list of viral identification tools. Uh, when we started this a number of years ago, uh, five or six years ago, um, there was only like one or two tools that really, um, yeah, two tools um, that we felt confident that you could use in order to identify viruses. There were a handful of what I'd call um, I don't know, pre that period tools um, that could be used in order to identify um, prophage regions or um, uh, viral-like elements in data sets, but they weren't really uh, codified as here, this is a tool you can take a, a microbial data set, apply this tool and suddenly get you know, beautiful viruses. Um, so hopefully I don't over speak too much about that, but there's basic, there's a very clear kind of a couple of years, there were more tools. There were some tools available that you could kind of sort of use. Um, and then, you know, you, uh, I guess, yeah, we had via sorter and then there's everything that kind of came after that. And then finally, there's these viral processing kind of grab bag analysis set. Um, once you have your viral genomes and you've kind of assessed the quality of those viral genomes, then you can actually do something with it. And this is usually kind of the part that, um, uh, these are the prefigures that would go in a uh, manuscript or paper unit. Um, you can take um, your viral genomes and you can figure out uh, distributions like global uh, distributions or temporal variations. Um, you can do population ecology um, using various tools. You can do protein clustering. Um, you can identify the functional um, or structural um, features of these viruses. Um, and something people always love to do is actually identify the potential hosts um, that these viruses have um, and the influences those hosts might have in the various you know, communities that you're studying. I won't talk really much about the microbial process and components. Um, in the papers, we do discuss that a little bit. And next week, um, I will kind of talk about a few tools that you can use to process um, the microbial components, but um, for the most part, we won't really talk about that. Um, you'll have plenty of time to take your uh, assembled data and then, you know, bin them, uh, consolidate, as we've discussed the past couple of weeks, go through um, with Checkam and GTDBTK um, to get a um, kind of a taxonomic understanding of your microbes. And then you can apply um, this tool that basically goes in and connects um, the viruses and the microbes to you know, identify their hosts. Um, so I mentioned this earlier is that OSC, every single tool, I'm pretty sure every single tool that is in, that iVirus is integrated in Cyvirus and that's in Kbase um, and maybe, you know, 30 to 50% of the tools that we've already integrated into Cyverse or Kbase um, that we haven't integrated there um, are actually available on OSC. So let's say we've got, oh God, I don't know how many we have. Uh, let's say there's you know, 50 tools available between Cyverse and Kbase for you to use. Um, we have like another 25 that we're not even gonna touch, but those are available to those who use uh, OSC. Um, and next week um, I will have um, links to kind of the resources and the tools that are available that we don't really discuss here. Um, but the reason I didn't want to talk too much about OSC is because most of that is uh, command line and users of OSC um, um, generally don't need to have all the pretty kind of figures and point and click web um, browser that we're going to go through this week. Um, and a lot of this is just copying and pasting code. And so I didn't want to bore people with, you know, a page of, you know, here, copy and paste this piece of code. Um, but next week, um, once I share those links, you'll be able to um, just take your, you know, 
context file and copy and paste view sorter code and then um, press enter and on OSC and you'll have a processed you know data set afterward. Um, so week two, um, Sharif actually went over uh, general Linux kind of HPC information um, and cyber infrastructures are pretty much the same thing. They're like a, a giant HPC for um, you know the public for other researchers. Um, and they provide compute. So they provide CPUs and RAM that you need in order to run these software programs. They provide data transfer um, because you need to be able to transfer your data sets from the sequencing center or from your computer or your you know, local HPC to the cyber infrastructure. Um, they provide storage, so you need to you know, store that somewhere. You can't just like have the data set. And typically on HPCs, you have the data set get run um, um, on like a, a node that kind of runs it. And then the data you know, has to get transferred back to your files or folders um, in order for you to then process it in subsequent steps. Um, cyber infrastructures provide enough disk space um, enough storage space for you to um, process, you know, most of your data sets so that you don't have to worry about that. Um, I don't think I touched upon this at all, but on um, Cyverse, I think you're given at least 100 gigabytes of free space. And you should be able to request a terabyte, I think a terabyte. Um, I'm sure someone will call me out if that's not true. Um, but a terabyte of disk space is a heck of a lot of um, uh, data for you to, to kind of play with. Um, and so you should be able to process at least individual metagenomes um, on either of these cyber infrastructures. And um, if you have like hundreds of metagenomes, hundreds of data sets that you need to put together, you might be able to manage that um, on Cyverse and KBase. There have been publications where people have processed hundreds of data sets in KBase. Um, but it's not um, it's not as easy as it would be on OSC or uh, using a, a command line interface, or you could just simply, you know, have a bash script that would process. You know, it's like I have a hundred files in this directory. Run this particular um, set of commands against every single file in this folder. Um, of course, you can always. Uh, ask me how to do that. Um, that's kind of one of the things that we do provide um, with iVirus is the kind of the know-how in order to do that. Um, but we won't you know, really talk about it today. Okay, so Cyverse. Um, Cyverse is kind of, I'm always excited talking about Cyverse and KBase, um, mainly because they, they just have so many resources um, available and a lot of people have, have no idea you know, they're struggling on their local machines or their HPC just trying to get stuff to work um, when you have resources like Cyverse or KBase. Uh, Cyverse is um, a uh, NSF funded um, project um, that seeks to basically bring, um, bring, you know, all this computational capability, storage um, and know-how, just make it available to the public. They available to the community. Um, they have thousands, many, actually several thousands now of apps. Um, and these apps cover um, data conversion, uh, QC and data cleaners, assembly, binning, annotation. You know, you could you can read this here, sequence analysis and phylogenetics. Um, they have so many apps um, that if I didn't make a pro and cons slide for the two um, cyber infrastructures. And mainly because I really don't like people comparing them head to head, um, because in some ways they really complement each other. But now they're basically two two ways to kind of approach addressing the same problem. And I feel like when people start comparing them, you know, uh, actually I'll say this in a couple slides. But um, so Cyrus is funded by the NSF, and KBase is funded by the the DOE. And um, uh, I guess, I, I don't know why, but people always compare them because they're the only, they're the, the two big names 
And so I guess that's what people, people like to do. Um, but they're really designed for just, you know, different people that want to maybe process their data in certain ways. And, you know, it's great that they take different um, ways of handling and processing and their outlook on processing data, um, because a lot of people don't um, kind of just sit back and appreciate the kind of resources that they provide. Um, you can use either one of them. I don't, I don't care. The, re the whole reason that, you know, iVirus has, you know, added KBase is simply to uh, bring more viral ecology tools to a larger, larger audience. And that people who maybe don't like Cyverus or don't want to use Cyverus, so there's something about Cyverus they don't like, um, that's fine. You know, you can go to KBase because if you don't like Cyverus, you probably will like KBase. And if you don't like KBase, you probably will like Cyverus. Um, and of course, Cyverus also provides other resources um, so that you don't have to use either of them. And then they also have, um, oh yeah, I should mention that. Uh, so if there is one negative that I would have about um, Cyverus is that they have so many apps. If you don't have someone guiding you or you know what you're looking for, you can become um, lost in what apps maybe you want to use or which apps are right for the job. So when you... Um, log into Cyber, uh, Cyverus that we'll do today. Hopefully I'm just taking a long time talking. Um, that when you log in, you'll be, you'll be hit with hundreds of apps. And so anyone who doesn't know, um, like which assembler should I use? You log into Cyverus and you've got, you know, 50 assemblers with different versions and different parameters. You have like no idea which, which specific version of like Metaspades you wanna use or what the appropriate uh, parameters are for assembling your data set. Um, and Cyverus does provide resources to kind of navigate some of that, but it's definitely not the same as um, KBase, which offers far fewer apps, but their organization and like kind of level of um, rigorous, um, you can't publish anything in our infrastructure unless it's like perfect, um, is definitely a different design philosophy. And then they also have tons and tons of data. In fact, um, iVirus, um, I was saying, provides data sets. We provide most of these data sets through Cyverse um, because they just have so much you know, free um, data uh, space that we can use in order to you know, make these available, publicly available. Okay, let's see, click. Um, so I'm gonna kind of speed up because I'm taking longer than I should. Um, they have various kind of levels of resources available to um, researchers. Um, they've got what are called these products, which are uh, what the end users or us um, are going to be mostly dealing with. And so this atmosphere, um, which is like their cloud stuff. Um, there's the discovery environment, which we're going to be using. There's uh, image processing and other kind of apps. The data commons is um, the disk space and resources that they have available. Um, the next thing is the services. So this is more lower level stuff, um, which developers can interact with in order to access, you know, the fundamental as um, attributes, uh, aspects, I should say, of those products. And then finally, we have this kind of other stuff, which I won't talk about at all. This is more hardcore um, uh, development system administration, um, that kind of stuff um, that we will definitely not talk about. Um, but there are, I put this here just to show people that there's a lot of moving parts in a huge structure like Cyverse. Um, and so if you know something's not working or something's um, a little slow, or maybe like you know, something might have happened, um, just realize that there's you know hundreds of moving parts at any one time. So if there is some issue, usually it's some, you know. Um, something that's moving its way through the system and just check back um, and it should be fine um, shortly. So we're going to talk about mainly discovery environment and the data commons. And so I actually have um, this is here, um, a kind of a sign up kind of portion um, that we can go through. Um, let me exit my full screen. Is it going to let me exit full screen? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, 
And I did this just in case um, there were any issues um, with Cybros or Kbase because you know it's um, you always dread maybe they go down for maintenance unexpectedly or maybe there's a, an error and then suddenly you've got like no resource in order to use. Um, but with Cybros, let's. Um, I just wanted to go through and take like maybe the next five minutes to kind of um, go through and like browse Cybros um, because it's so important. Um, in order to you know, run these tools. So you can sign up. Um, here we have cyverse.org, C-Y-V-E-R-S-E.org. Um, you can sign up over here on the top right. Um, hopefully it doesn't recognize, okay, good. Um, you can type in your first name, last name, username, and email that you'd like to use. Um, and then next, you can, um, what's it called? There might be some information that'll request about like your affiliation and stuff like that. Um, Cyrus only uses this for like statistics and reporting to um, NSF. Um, they're not trying to like take any of your personal information. There's not really any personal information, so to speak, anyway. Um, but um, feel free. Um, it actually helps people kind of find you if you have, you know, your first name, last name, and the institution, because one of the components in Cyrus is the ability to share data with other researchers. And if there's you know, five bins out there. Um, you have no idea which bin it is unless, you know, they might have some university affiliation or what their position might be. Um, there could be a, you know, a bin that's a PI at the, you know, Ohio State University. And then there could be a bin that's a, um, uh, a research scientist, you know? And so if you have a little bit of information about yourself, you can more easily find others. Um, and so you can sign up. Um, through that, it takes a few minutes to create an account. It might even be immediate now. It took a couple minutes when I did this, like you know, five, six, seven years ago. Um, and so you can sign up for that. If you don't want to use Cyverse um, and you don't care about that, you want to use Kbase, that's fine. You don't have to do this. Um, but if you do, um, you don't have to do this right now. Just clarifying that. Um, you can sign up anytime between now and next week in order to use. Um, the resources when we go through this next week. Um, let's move that down. Let's get my face right there. So, and okay. so log in. Um, let me move this a little higher. So when you log in, oh goodness gracious, um, log in. I've got my username and password already here. Um, okay. So this is kind of the the user portal, the homepage um, for Cyverse. Um, they have a learning center, which basically shows you, um, um, you know, it's it's got all this information about how to use their resources, um, kind of a, you know, Cyverse 101. They have a webinar. They actually have a number of webinars in order to use their resources. I won't go through those. Um, at this landing page, this homepage, it tells you the services that are available or the ones that you're most likely to use as well as all the other resources, the products that we just mentioned that are available. Um, they have all these powered by Cypress. And these are um, all of those other third-party tools and applications that were in the products that I kind of skipped. Um, these are all of the kind of third-party tools, you know, something like iVirus, this iMicrobe here would be, you know, powered by Cypress. We were using their resources um, you know, freely using their resources in order to produce these, you know, products. Um, so let's go through here. Um, there are two different discovery environments. Um, there's a DE discovery environment 1.0 um, that they've had since uh, the beginning. And they also just launched a 2.0 like last month. Um, so I just scrambled in order to like figure out how, how to use that. Um, it's not really much different. Um, it's just the same interface, just um, um, organized for, you know, uh, a more modern web, so to speak. So if you click on just this discovery environment, oh, actually, if you have any um, requests, if you have any issues, you can just go through here. Um, they do have a whole host of, actually, let's click here, hopefully, uh, workshops that you can go through. Um, and there should be more than that. But 
yeah, interesting. Um, there's more workshops than that. Interesting. Uh, so let's go back. Of course, there we go. Okay. Uh, let's just go through just quickly launch the DE 1.0. So this is after you've um, signed up, you've logged in to that kind of landing page. You can choose DE 1.0 or 2. Um, so log in. It should just pass my credentials again. Uh, keeps stuff that I've opened. Uh, so um, the cyber, the DE 1.0 is very a simplified format. It has three kind of icons, three different sections. The first is data, which is basically a file browser folder for all of your resources. For example, that's my this is my home directory. These are the um, files that I have, at least in my home directory, um, you know, in my organization, um, like my file and folder organizations. Um, you can browse the community data. So this is, you know, freely available resources. Um, actually, we've got iVirus right here. You know, you can browse these files, folders. Um, if you have bioinformatics class that we did, um, example data for all of our tools. We have published different um, data sets that have, you know, various levels of processing, reads, contigs, um, et cetera, um, assemblies, et cetera, yes. Uh, I won't talk about this for too long, but yeah, basically you can go through, these are where we store a lot of the iVirus resources. Next, we have apps and let's see. So this is apps and development. So it's an old app that I was developing um, that's now been replaced by newer apps. Um, so this is one I talk about. There's a dizzying number of apps available. Um, there is some organization, but not mostly on the HPC, sadly. Um, and so there's quite a, a few apps. Um, there's Bowtie Batch, that's something we'll talk about. Uh, Btrim, they have the name of the um, integrators. So these aren't, these aren't the software author names, but the person who integrated into Cyber. So if there's a problem with the app, it's usually the integration or the input parameters that you have for the app. Um, so, you know, this is the person you probably need to complain to, um, but definitely complain to Cyrus first because they might be able to fix it without the integrator's intervention. Um, there's quite a few apps um, available. So uh, yeah, you'll have to um, navigate the, the ocean of apps that they're available, which is great that they have guides and that, you know, iVirus has guides and protocols to tell you which one of these thousands of apps in order to use. Um, and then finally, we have analyses, which is basically what analyses you ran. Um, it's got the name of the tool, the parameters. You can relaunch it. You can share this particular analysis with collaborators, um, et cetera. Go to your output folder, which is in the, the data directories um, for you to navigate through there. Okay. Um, Let's see, go back to PowerPoint. Um, so let's say we've created our account. Oops, created our account. We've gone through 1.0. Um, and then we're gonna launch DE 2.0. Actually created little videos for each of these um, in case you know there's any issues. So data, apps, analyses. Um, and then we have the kind of the 2.0. Actually, let's go back here. Sorry about switching that. Um, DE 2.0, I just know that link, um, there we go. Um, so if you do the DE, I should probably say that, DE cybers.deo, um, that org, you can go to the 2.0, or as you just saw on the previous page, you can actually click on the 2.0, um, and I won't belabor the point, it's got kind of a reorganization of where the data and stuff are. Um, recent analyses um, that I've run, the public apps that are available, um, videos, this is kind of what I was thinking about. Um, these are more webinars and videos on how to use various tools and cyber resources. This is the data's, um, this is kind of like a, a newer, more, you know, uh, view of the file and folder 
hierarchy that you saw before. Um, it has um, better customization so that you can kind of filter these so that they're more easily organized, more so than just having a file and folder. These are all the apps, just, you know, it's a different view. Um, you can also manage your tools and filter them. Um, most of the apps that we have are split between the DE, the discovery environment and the HPC. Um, I didn't mention that before, but HPC uh, is, the HPC component of Cyverse is powered by the Texas Advanced Computing Center, TAC. Um, and so they've got large multi terabyte nodes for you to do your assemblies. And then finally, this is just all the analyses that you can do um, run on. Um, they also have teams, which are cool. I don't think I'm part of any teams here, um, but basically if there are um, groups, you know, groups that are on Cyverse that use Cyverse to, you know, communicate, to share their data, et cetera, run analyses and share them with each other, um, you can use teams for that. So just DE 2.0 is the same thing as DE 1. It's just, you know, someone argue it's better organized. But if you like the traditional file and folder hierarchy with the apps and kind of that simplified view, um, totally, it's totally fine. Um, okay. So let's go back to the back point. Let's actually go to the next slide. Okay, so KBase. Um, so we've talked about Cyverse um, and if you kind of like what you've seen, um, then you know that at least in terms of the UI, you know, Cyverse is, might might be something that you're interested in. Uh, KBase takes a different approach. Um, it doesn't have that kind of file folder. It uses what are called narratives to organize their experiments, um, and that's kind of easier um, shown. And I'll get into that um, in a moment. And then it takes and integrates kind of all this experimental data you have into what's called like a, a knowledge base. And it really looks like a graph. So all of the data you um, put into KBase, you know, after you've uploaded it, kind of gets connected to everything that you do henceforth on that piece of data. So this is kind of the provenance that Sharif was talking about using uh, Chime. And once you've processed let's say you've taken your, your reads and you've cleaned them up. Now you've connected your, you know, your reads state to your cleaned reads state. And that's connected by the fact you've cleaned it up with Trimomatic, um, uh, a popular you know, read uh, quality control filtering tool that we've, we've actually used. Um, and so, when you want to figure out what happened to your data or how you got to that point in your data processing, you can see all of the steps that you took in order to get there. Likewise, when you run five different analyses on the same assembly, let's say, um, all of that is connected. So you can go to that assembly and see, oh, there's five different analyses that have been run on that. Um, and while you might be familiar with what you've done for your work in your particular narrative or you know, your, for your data, if you share that with collaborators or with the public, they might not necessarily know what's available. They'll just see you know, your lab notebook, so to speak. And KBase offers a really nice way of organizing that data um, into like, an ex like a single experiment that was, that was done. Um, so, sorry, uh, let's go back to, let's just close servers so we don't have too many tabs open. Um, let's make that a little bit larger. Okay. So um, if you want to sign up for KBase, actually, let's go back. Come on, let's go back. Uh, maybe not. Okay. So unfortunately, I have to sign out and do all of that stuff. But the process for signing up for KBase is actually actually pretty similar. Um, let's actually go back to here. Okay, so let's see. Cool little movie. So when you want to sign up, 
Um, you can sign up through um, Google or Orc ID. Um, you can choose either of them, it doesn't matter. Um, I like to choose Orc ID just simply because, you know, I like Orc ID better than signing in through Google. Um, or if you're an old person like myself who used KBase before 2017, you can sign up through Globus. You can still sign up through Globus um, if you would like to or not. Um, it's, it's totally up to you. If you already have a Globus account and you have data in there, it would be advantageous to use Globus. Um, a lot of sequencing centers and HBCs have Globus endpoints. So if you want to use KBase, um, you can actually connect your Globus account. And then when you want to um, transfer data from your HPC or from um, your local machine, or maybe from the sequencing center, you can use Globus and transfer data directly into um, KBase, um, which is actually a really nice feature. Um, Cybers does have similar functionality. Um, it's just not as um, seamless as KBase has. Okay, so um, actually, let's go back. Yeah, app dev maintenance. So if you've already registered, um, if you've already signed up and you'll have a whole week to do this. So if I go way too fast here, um, just open up the presentation, go back to kbase.us and then um, you can go through here. Um, so if you've already registered, you can log in. And because I've just logged in uh, momentarily so there'd be no issues, um, here we go. Um, so this is kind of the reorganization that I was talking about. Um, it's similar to the kind of the DE 2.0 where you have this landing page. And I'm gonna click on these narratives in just a moment here, but um, to kind of summarize, each of these is organized. It tells you um, all the data that's in your, um, in your narrative, in your notebook or experiment. Um, and so you can see that these are things that we're gonna get to later. Um, that I have, uh, I've done an assembly using spades. I've binned, um, I shouldn't say binned. I said I didn't use binned. It's, it's kind of like a, a misnomer. I have to use the name bin in KBase. Um, but basically I've organized the viral sequences um, in, in groups um, for the analysis that we're gonna go through the next week. Um, but they're not technically bins. Um, all the different data objects. You have the paradigm libraries that I was using in here um, and other information about them. Um, let's see. So you have narratives that could be shared with you. Um, I have a few narratives shared with me that um, you know people are asking to troubleshoot. Um, there's tutorial narratives. So there's quite a few tutorials, um, quite a few tutorials um, that are available. Um, there's more than that. I don't know why. Oh, maybe. Okay. The public. Um, that's right. Um, that help you um, use Cybers KBase, sorry, KBase resources. There's also tons of public narratives um, that people have shared, either um, just sharing their narrative publicly, and they actually can get DOIs just like with protocols.io. Um, and for anyone who just wants to you know, share this with many users, for example, a webinar. Um, it doesn't have to be a tutorial. It could just be, hey, I wanna be able to you know, analyze a viral metagenome. Um, you can create a public narrative so that people don't even have to sign into KBase in order to see the processing steps um, to, do, to do that. Um, there's various organizations, I want to reloading the page. Um, and I'm part of three organizations right now. Um, actually, those are just, yeah, mine. Um, you can browse all the organizations. There's um, like a hundred or so organizations that you can be a part of. Um, and it's just, you know, you're part of a team. You can get, um, you know, uh, uh, look at the apps that might be under that team or the data or et cetera that are available. Um, so for example, if you click on iVirus, there should only be a few tools because there's only a few tools in order to use. Um, these are the narratives and there's actually should be three apps um, available. Um, it's kind of tiny because we just started out, but um, 
it's it's enough to process a, a data a viral metagenome. Um, there's also a catalog that has all of the apps available, um, and so you can organize um, by various you know attributes versions. Actually, this is really important. This is one thing that um, I would say that KBase um, clearly does better than Cyverse is that there's there's three stages of of apps. Um, there's apps in development, which are you know the developers are actively developing it. So there's like you know bits and pieces of code. Um, it's it's technically in uh, KBase, but it might not even be functional, um, or it could be totally 100% functional, and we're just waiting on you know KBase to allow it to be a, a beta app. Um, the second are beta apps. These are tools um, that have passed some level of quality control. Um, they should be functional and they should work, but they not, might not work for all situations or they might still have lingering bugs um, that need to be resolved. Um, so if you use beta apps, um, there is some expectation that the app will give you some type of output or some semblance of output that you can use for you know, subsequent steps. Apps in development, um, you, you have no guarantee that it's gonna work. You might click on, you know, run this app, and if it's an app in development, it might not run at all. So don't complain to the developer if um, it's not working because it's literally actively being developed. And then finally, the um, third category is the released apps. You should have an expectation that the app um, should work on all of the um, the inputs that you feed it, um, and so there, um, there is that. You know, I don't want to say guarantee, but it should work, basically. Um, let's see, beta apps. You know, every, every single released app has a beta version. Every single beta version has a development version. And Kbase um, can track kind of the provenances of the apps themselves. So you can have actually different versions of the same tool at different stages in the development, which um, still to the end user only looks like one app, but if the end user is proficient in KBase or is a you know, KBase help staff member, they can quickly figure out um, at what stage or what app level you were using or version. Um, one thing that's actually also another thing that's really nice is that um, KBase is funded by the DOE. Um, DO, JGI also has funding with DOE. I shouldn't say anything about that because I don't, I don't want to speak. Um, so KBase, you can search through um, all of the user data, all the public user data, uh, different genomes and references that they've um, added from um, uh, NCBI and other, you know, other resources. Um, and you can search through KBase data for a particular user um, or, you know, if you want to type in you know, tRNA, it's going to come up with lots of different tRNA resources. What I really like is the fact that they're connected to JGI. Um, and you can search actual JGI data. So it is possible that if you have your data sequenced by JGI and it's publicly available, keep in mind this is all public, you don't, we don't have, you know, no access to someone's private data. Um, but if JGI has made it public or it's two-year data embargo release or something like that. Um, you can search and I find it in JGI. Now, not all JGI data is available. Um, there's different blocks of data that you can access. Um, so, um, uh, so yeah, not everything is available. So for example, if you wanted to look for a particular um, PI, um, you can see that JGI has sequenced the line P um, viromes. And you can take and copy each of these data sets from um, this search page into your actual narrative. Um, and so you can, you know, uh, by PI, by proposal, by projects, etc. Um, I won't go into that too much um, more detail, but basically, you know, just browse around. And then finally, jobs. Um, I don't have any jobs that are running right now. Um, so if we click on narratives, we'll actually look at the viral analysis one. 
Come on. Oh, that's, I always do that. <laughs> the great thing about making um, those videos is that you can actually cut out all of the waiting time. So it looks like everything's instantaneous. Okay, so this is what a narrative looks like. Um, and the top left over here, we have the data that's available. Um, this is data that you've uploaded. So I uploaded this particular ER, uh, this um, SRA data set, which is what we're gonna use next week. Um, and so um, you can see all the different processing stages as you go through. Um, this is all stuff we're gonna go through next week. So you don't have to be too concerned. Um, there's information about each one of these um, little kind of data things that are a bit more information than um, Cyrus kind of provides. Second are the apps and the app organizations. Um, so kind of like with Cyverse, they were kind of broadly organized. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out is that, you know, we have our little virus tools down here. Um, these are two tools that we're gonna go through as well, actually this week and next week. And then we can also click, and so we can look at beta apps um, that I was mentioning before. And you'll notice that um, virus has three of them now because um, I haven't um, gotten Vera Matcher, which matches viruses and hosts, um, approved to be released. Um, I think it's in some stage of the, you know, the releasing process. And so um, this is a beta app that you can use. And um, according to the developer and a couple of the other beta testers, it's ready to be released. Um, Cyverse doesn't have the same mechanism. Um, so some apps may or may not work. Um, you should, like I said, have an expectation that at least the released apps should be working. And then finally, we have this giant, it's, um, if people are familiar with um, Python, um, these are Jupyter notebooks. You can actually type HTML and Markdown in here as well. Um, and this is actually, you know, part of the webinar series that I gave a couple of months ago. Um, and you actually process a SRA data set, like literally an actual raw data set, all the way through um, to uh, class to um, identifying the, vi the virus, annotating them, um, classifying them. And I would like to add um, um, identifying the potential hosts of them as well. Um, we'll see. We'll see if I can get that. Um, all ready and good. Um, but you can see clearly that all of your data, all of your, this is like literally a lab notebook. You can type notes in to each one of these um, cells, which is what they're called. And um, you can share this with other people. You can share this with collaborators. And once you do that, um, they will have access to the data, underlying data, and all of the apps that you used. And so one awesome thing I like about this is the fact that um, you can click on this narrative. In fact, this is a public narrative. So KBase, yes, yes. Okay, this is a public narrative. I'm not logged in. Um, I can actually, you know, you should be able to type, type this in if you'd wanted to. We're gonna go through this next week or you can pause this and over the course of next week and look at this, but um. Um, you don't have to sign in to KBase in order to see the processing steps um, to, um, you know, to, to process your viral data set. Um, and this is actually really great because um, it doesn't require you, one, to log in, um, two, you don't have to, you can just follow along. And then all of the data and something actually really nice is all the citations. Um, so we make sure that... Um, um, that all of the apps that get integrated have appropriate um, auth like original author, I should say, attribution. Um, and so that's you know one of the kind of great features about publishing. And this is a DOI. There's a DOI associated with this. So anytime someone um, uses this particular app, there's some type of reference or citation um, that I, actually myself and Ben and Zach get um, saying you know this was published. Um, okay. Yes. So now that we've gone through Cyverse and KBase, um, 
for the first like, you know, 45 minutes, which is really important because if we just get started with actual data next week, you'll have, you'll be lost. And I don't want anyone to be lost. Um, these are kind of the steps that we went through before. Um, let's just start here. Okay, so we went through the data transformation, uh, the, the data import and stuff like that. Um, the apps, um, the narrative kind of experiment based and the search. Okay, so IMG is um, a totally, totally different beast. Um, what IMG is are basically, it's viral data that JGI has sequenced or has collected um, and have put into um, their, you know, their various standardized pipelines and process them. And if you've submitted data to JGI and, um, or they've sequenced data for you and you're past the data embargo, they've already gone through the, you know, the processing steps um, of getting their data into um, their, this kind of resource. And actually I shouldn't have gone to the full page. Um, they have these three, actually these kind of four overall organizational units for all of the content. Um, this is IMG, JGI, doe.gov slash VR. Um, we'll go to this in a moment. So this is basically all of their data that they have. And each one of these kind of sections is overlapping. Um, they have viral data sets that are the UVIGs that we talked about earlier. Um, they have those VOTUs. So these are actually the clustered, so to speak, viruses, or at least um, genomes that are at the species, approximately the species level rank. Um, they have um, data sets that actually have a predicted host associated with them. And then they've got quality um, of those, you know, UVIGs or those, you know, VCs or the, the VOTUs that have various levels of quality. And so there is a lot of overlap between um, these data sets. So don't just simply like sum up all these values and say, hey, there's this many in uh, at JGI or IMG. Um, so to kind of break that down a little bit further, in fact, I just did, um, you have the viral data sets that are those UVIGs, those uncultivated viral genomes. Um, you have those VOTUs that are clustered by those MUVIG standards. Um, and then you also have the ones that have, you know, host information, or if you're looking at for specific quality. Um, what's great, and um, the reason they're doing it like this is because if you remember that paper um, that I referenced earlier, um, is that this follows their general, actually the authors of this are, you know, JGI, include JGI people. So, of course, um, they published this paper, and so the resources that they offer are going to follow, you know, their um, organizational scheme. And these are the different features um, that you kind of need in order to submit a sequence and what kind of quality um, that overall genome sequence is. So you have your microbial and my microbial metagenomes, um, viral metagenomes. They go through this identification process that we're going to go through. And you need to have some annotation, some type of classification, or if it's a VOTU, so you have to make sure that it's kind of a species, um, what type of host you have, what kind of quality you have, um, and then um, you know submitting this to a particular database. These are the kind of groupings that you do find here. Um, okay, so I do have this fairly lengthy video um, that sometimes skips because it's so long. Um, so let's just go to VR. Um, so if you go to IMG VR, in fact, see if I can find it from the JGI homepage. Ah, oh, yes, you can. Okay, so you can go to IMG, just type in JGI IMG and Google, and that will bring you to this page. Click on that. So this works. Do, 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 do. Okay, so these are the virus resources um, that are kind of available. Um, all of these pretty much offer the exact same interface. So once I click on one of these, the kind of information that you have um, are going to be filtered by whatever 
whatever this is. So if I click, let's for example, click on a VOTU. So this is species rank that will load this. Um, the reason why I made videos for this one in particular is because um, if you request a lot of information, um, it will take a while to process, um, which is kind of the big downside of JGI. Um, so I clicked on that particular link right there. Um, and that's already pre-filtered everything to the VOTUs. Um, now, if I clicked on quality, I would only get like the highest quality viral genomes um, or those that are you know, purported to be the highest quality. Or if I clicked on those that have a guaranteed CRISPR spacer um, identified host, it's like a 100% chance or not, maybe not 100. Um, these, this whole page would already be filtered because I've got over 5,000 entries here. Um, and being able to do that first level of filtering based on what you wanna look for um, really goes a long way um, in order to be able to kind of, you know, make sense of it all. And so for every single, like no matter what you filtered, you're still gonna have all of these columns. You're gonna have the UVIG ID, the genome name um, that's been, you know, provided to that, how many scaffolds. So this is kind of a holdover from the, well, I guess they can have multiple, um, from the microbial data set the lineage. So this is through uh, IMG VR's like processing pipeline, um, the OTU that that's a part of. And so this UVIG, this genome could be part of um, a group that are all related at the species level. So these could be like, you know, lots of different strains would be, you know, organized under this, under this so to speak. Um, what type of contact it is, um, you know, what the topology has, you know, if it has a direct terminal repeat, it's likely closed. Um, um, on the quality, you know, if you're publishing um, a data set, you need to know what the quality is. Um, and uh, you'd probably be, you know, a little concerned that there'd be ends here, but maybe not. Um, completion, um, completeness, um, how many um, uh, CDSs they have, tRNAs they might have. Um, the percent of um, uh, profiles that they have, domain hits, et cetera, um, how they identified this, um, the ecosystems that that particular UVIG was identified in, um, predicted host lineages, and what kind of host detection method they have. And if you're familiar with the JGI system, you realize that you can simply click on a particular um, UVIGs and then add them to your, you can add, add, add the underlying genes if you want to do gene work or the actual scaffolds or them to your genome cart. That genome cart gets added and then you can go through and um, go to your, like your genome cart. I'm not going to add anything right now because it's going to take, take a while. Um, and then you could download those if you wanted to, or if you're interested in Let's say, clearly, I've already clicked on this. I wanted to make sure that it worked. Um, you know, I think I've typed in, let's actually, let's type in soil for an ecosystem. Yes, okay. Um, environmental soil, ah, there we go. Okay, so if I wanted to search for soil genomes, and this is something you can kind of sort of do in Kbase, but you can't do in Cyverse, um, if you want to filter actual specific genomes for soil, um, you can do that through this interface. And in fact, if I want a soil um, virus that infects bacteria, infects coli, I guess, um, and I want it to be high quality, bam, I already have my particular, oh, and I've got you know, a predicted um, viral lineage. This is actually pretty cool. Um, I haven't clicked on this. Hopefully there's nothing crazy about this sequence. Um, you can click on that and get more information. Um, it gives you basic information. This is also what you'd see if you're familiar with IMG. Um, the neighborhood is basically um, what the genome looks like. And you can actually click on, if I was a PFAM expert, I would actually know what these mean. Um, I really hope some of these are, you know, capsid proteins and portal proteins, et cetera. 
um, their host prediction, how it was predicted. There could be multiple predictions here, I think, um, depending on the tool that was used to predict them. Um, the taxonomy and how that was identified. In fact, uh, this was like, probably identified because um, it had lots of hits against RefSeq. Um, the genes that are available. So if you're interested in doing some type of you know, genomic work, like how these genes you know, spread across various ecosystems, you'd be able to grab specific genes, um, figure out which PFAM they're in or other, um, um, what's it called? Other data sets that could be in, actually, I definitely won't do this. You can actually search through and find similar UVIGs um, to the particular one that you're interested in. So if you identified a UVIG that has um, a particular set of features that you're interested in, you can look for other UVIGs that might have similar characteristics. And then you could go click, you'd be able to click on them. Um, let's see, that could be a capsid protein. Oh, it's hypothetical. Oh, uh, yes, hypothetical. Um, in fact, maybe, oh, phage GPA. Um, so yeah, this is a viral protein. It's still, you know, considered hypothetical, um, but this is probably a pretty good candidate to be a virus. And if you wanted others that have that particular PFAM, that fit feature, um, you could click on and use that. Um, and so you'd add, you know, go back, you'd add those genes or genomes to your, um, your cart. And then once you added them to the cart, you could download or do some type of analysis on them. Okay. Now for the point, point that you've all been waiting for. Okay. So actually going through the tools. Um, okay. So the first thing we'd always want to do is go through the quality control and the um, quality control and the kind of the QC um, for your reads. Um, and on Cyverse and Kbase, um, there's a number of resources available, number of tools. Um, but first, um, so to talk about um, what kind of thresholds or quality that your reads should go through um, when you're handling a viral data set, there was an awesome paper published just a couple of years ago um, that basically did this whole um, virus QA quality assembly thing. And um, this was published like I said, a couple of years ago that actually used um, uh, various benchmarks. And so I'm gonna kind of go through this more quickly. Um, apologies. Um, so reads, so they basically looked at um, how much genome, you, so they had these various um, uh, metagenomes and they looked at how much of the genome they actually recovered and what kind of coverage they required in order to get that um, uh, genome recovered. Um, and so just to kind of orient your eyes to kind of this, this kind of graph, um, down here you have how much um, genome coverage they put as input into this assembly, and then what percent of the genomes that were in here, so let's say they've got 100 specific genomes in there that they you know, artificially put in there. Um, and how much of the genome did they recover? So you want to be have a lot of um, your genome recovered. That's how you equate um, how good or how well you assembled your data set. Or at least that's classically how a lot of people think of it. Um, and um, basically, the more genomes the more um, coverage that you provide, the more reads that you provide, you get a greater percentage of your genome um, recovered. And it turns out that, you know, as long as you um, clean up your reads, it doesn't really matter which tool you use, um, as long as you, you know, basically just use the defaults. So use the defaults of Trimomatic, use the defaults of um, BB Duke. Um, um, actually, I think I'd talk about the ones that are available. Yes, right here. So on Cyverse, there's Cutadap, B-Trim, Sickle, Trim Galore, Trimomatic. Um, that's a whole, that's a mouthful. Um, you can use any one of these tools and you're probably good to go. Um, you basically just want to remove the adaptive sequences and the, um, um, and any adapt, uh, the primers and adaptive sequences 
and any low quality sequence um, sequences. Um, that's really all you really need to do. Um, because most of the assemblies that you have will be um, dependent on which um, will, will really depend on um, removing those regions where they could possibly erroneously overlap. So they also looked at what the best assembler could be. Um, and they evaluated a number of different assemblers. We've talked about IDBA, UD, Megahit, and Metaspades. Um, I think we did mention Velvet, but we haven't talked about um, Omega. And using the same kind of graph, it really doesn't matter. Um, and um, really, IDBA, Megahit, and Metaspades um, all performed kind of equally well in this analysis. Um, and basically, the more input reads you provide, the better your assembly is. Um, so if, for example, in this data set, by the time you get to 10x coverage, um, you can use any one of these assemblers, except maybe MetaVelvet, which is kind of the outlier here. Um, and you can get near complete genome recovery. And these are, these are viruses. Um, and so, you know, the name of the game is, you know, feed as much data as you can um, without going too crazy, and you should be able to assemble your viral genomes. Now, there's caveats here um, because it wouldn't be a paper with just you know this single figure. Um, and so they decided, the authors decided to really look at um, various aspects of not just genome completeness, um, but what kind of quality, what was the composition of those um, those viruses, those those uh, assembled genomes. And so they basically looked at a various number of aspects. The first was chimeric contigs. So these are um, contigs that are comprised of two or more different genomes. And the reason that this happens is because um, these are um, de Bruin graph assemblers. And so they have very small camera sizes. And um, if you have any repeats or areas of overlap that are you know a part of that camera size? Let's say you know uh, 33 or 55 or something like that. Then um, that is a region that you can have an overlap for, um, and uh, that will cause confusion in the assembly algorithm um, when the you know the De Bruin graph is trying to figure out the you know the shortest path, the most efficient path through, and um, and at least for these three, um, MegaHit performed better because you want the lower percentage of chimeric contigs than IDBA, UD, or Metaspades. Um, but keep in mind that this is like this is all less than one percent of chimeric contigs. So you have a thousand genomes, um, and that's what um, ten, you know, um, chimeric contigs thousand. Yes, um, and that's really, you know, you get a fraction of a percent, you know, half a percent maybe better, a third of a percent better. And so um, whatever one you choose will probably be okay. Mega hit does have the edge here. Now, you could also look at false positive circular contigs. So should these genomes have been circularized? Did they represent a complete genome? Because um, a lot of software and tools think that a viral genome is complete if you've been able to circularize it. And that's kind of an assumption that we've made um, in kind of the, you know, the viral community that if you, if you can circularize a genome, then it should be complete. But what happens if your assembler completes that for you and is wrong? Um, you've now falsely, you have a false circular contact. And um, comparing the two of these, um, you find that Metaspades does have a bit more of an edge in this case um, uh, versus IDBA and Megahit. And um, that is you know, definitely something um, to consider. Um, so the next thing they looked at was strain heterogeneity. And this is kind of, uh, can be a little confusing. And strain heterogeneity is basically how many different strains um, you have in your particular data set. Like how, how um, uh, another way to look at it is 
how few on the opposite end, basically, of how to look at it is how few um, different versions you have of the same genome. So you could have 10 very similar viruses that share lots of parts of their genome. That would be very um, heterogeneous. But if you had 10 totally different viruses that infecting you know, different domains of life have totally different structures that has very low strain heterogeneity. And what this figure is what they showed is that the more different viruses you have here, um, the harder it is for assemblers to assemble them. And the only way to really combat that is to have um, a, lot of, a lot of coverage. Um, you need to be able to have so much coverage that the assemblers um, don't have a hard time trying to assemble the tiny differences between them. So for example, if you had you know, those 10 genomes that are very heterogeneous and they all look like each other, they might have you know, 30, 40, 50%, let's say, of their genomes that are really, really similar. But if you sequence it to incre like incredible amounts, then you're gonna be able to start zoning in on those specific strain differences, strain level differences and provide enough support for the, um, the assembly algorithm so that you can actually start resolving that. But most environmental um, metagenomes aren't going to have that much um, coverage. You're not, you're not going to be able to go deep enough in order to overcome that. And so, you know, if you have um, um, more, um, let's say, if you have less coverage and you're in an environmental data set, then um, you really need to be cautious about um, uh, the performance of your assemblers. And so if, if you're gonna find yourself having a lot of very similar genomes, you're just gonna have to accept the fact that you're not gonna be able to assemble strain level variation. Um, you're gonna be get you know, your VOTU level. You're gonna maybe get your virus species um, but you won't be able to get any deeper than that, which for someone who's doing microbial data sets might be a little concerning because that would be like a mag. But um, at this point, at this level, um, and actually this is kind of a problem for microbial data sets too, but it's even more so um, important for viruses. So just to summarize, clean your reads, um, more coverage gives you better assemblies. Um, you can choose whatever assembly you want. I'm not gonna, well, I shouldn't name any names. Um, personal, I personally um, prefer Metaspades um, just because it does have that edge. The negative of Metaspades, and I probably should have put a table up here, is that um, it has an incredible um, uh, consumption of memory. And so you um, are going to find yourself consuming hundreds of gigabytes to terabytes of memory with a moderate to large scale metagenome. You could potentially. And um, the thing with a lot of these Dubruin graphs is that the relationship between memory usage and size of data set is not always linear. So the greater the complexity of your data set, and I think this is true for microbial data sets as well, but definitely in microbial ones, um, the more complex your data set is, the more memory you're gonna be use, using because the Bruin graph is going to have to require, you know, more of uh, memory in order to encompass all of that um, variation in the, in the graph itself. Um, and so I would not use Metaspades if, I was physically unable, physically, if I didn't have the memory to do so. Um, however, MegaHit uses a different um, kind of um, algorithm, I guess you could call it. Um, and it has a much, much, much lower memory um, use. And so you might be using, you know, 500 gigabytes of memory for Metaspades that MegaHit uses five for. Um, and so 
uh, you might want to choose mega hit and take you know the hit in with chimeric um, with maybe you know circular context or strain heterogeneity or something like that and just use mega hit that's totally fine um you know no one's gonna you know not publish a paper because you use mega hit over meta spades or anything like that um i think a lot of the uh and in the literature people are kind of you know if you use good quality reads you get um you know you use a good assembler um and you provide you know rationale for why you did something um you know that that, that will be fine and in the end they basically all perform relatively similarly in this um benchmark paper and i can tell you from personal experience um you really don't see much um of a difference um i think idba ud has um has more genomes that are generated um and so more genomes are kind of like removed or filtered but the um but once you call your viruses after you know after you've assembled them and you clean up the quality and you've called your viruses um the number of viruses that agree between all three of them are really really similar you know in some cases for really some data sets are like statistically you know um equivalent um so you know, even if you're getting rid of more contexts or IDBA UD makes more contexts, it might not necessarily be um, affect your downstream results at all. Okay, so viral identification, um, which is like the, the biggest kind of delimiter here. So like I said before, there's no marker genes, but that's actually not a problem because um, a lot of the thinking, the, the brain work um, has been um, done by a lot of the authors of the viral um, identification tools. And um, to basically kind of organize how um, the various mechanisms of identifying viruses, they've kind of been broad, broadly categorized into basically two categories. You can use gene content and genomic features, or you can use camera frequencies. Um, and gene content and genomic features, if you're not kind of familiar with that, would be like viral hallmark genes, um, like for example, the major capsid protein. You know, there's no microbes that have a major capsid protein because that's a virus kind of exclusive virus life cycle thing. Um, portal proteins, um, you don't need microbes to, and oh, I guess you could have microbes infect other microbes, but they don't use portal proteins to do it. Um, and then you also have like the terminase large subunits. So these are virus exclusive, almost virus hallmark genes um, that are exclusive to viruses. So if you do have a contig that has these hallmarks, you can likely, um, be, you can be confident that they're um, viruses. You can also look at, so that's gene content, but you can also look at the features themselves. Um, and I put a couple examples here, like for example, strand switching. Viruses tend, tend, this is all rough approximations, but viruses tend to have um, their genes organized on a single strand or only on a couple strands going in mo mainly the same direction. Um, and um, they often have, you know, very um, tight, um, uh, very, very few non-coding regions, I should say. Um, those genes could be long, they could be short, but they're always right up, up abutted next to each other. Um, and another kind of feature is the fact that it's, it's, it's not a feature, uh, it's more gene content, um, is that many viruses are unknown or uncharacterized. Many virus uh, genes are unknown or uncharacterized proteins, as opposed to microbial genomes where Many of them, well, are you know uncharacterized or unknown, um, do have quite a few PFAM hits. So you can actually use one of the challenges of identifying viruses to identify viruses. And the fact that if you don't hit many of the databases, especially microbial databases, you're likely not a microbe and thus more likely to be a virus. And so you can take all of these kind of um, rules or guides, and if you have, you know, you have strand, very uh, few strand switchings events, very short genes, reduced PFAM hits, 
none of those individually kind of gives you confidence that you have a virus, but taken together, they provide much more lines of evidence to support the fact that this might be a very viral genome. Um, and if you were to com combine that with maybe having one or two viral hallmark genes, you know, your confidence in making that prediction or that call is greatly increased. Um, and then you can take either of those features like uh, the gene content, genomic features, or the chemist frequencies and either apply some type of statistical method, like you can weight those. So for example, if you have um, three hallmark genes, you get three points. And if you have, you know, three other genomic features, um, like strand switching, you get like half a point. And so you could basically, you know, this is a very basic, um, not really used, but you can just add those points up. And if you have more than five points, hey, you're a virus. If you have two points, then maybe you're not a virus. Or you can apply machine learning and let, you know, black box algorithms figure out um, um, based on, you know, what those features are and basically learn them um, what they could um, uh, predict viruses. And so the first tool, um, the first kind of suite of tools basically uses the gene content and genomic features and either a statistical method or machine learning method to apply them. And the first is what I call, um, it's traditionally what I think of as the gold standard. I'm a little biased, um, I should be honest, and I little, I'm a little biased in that it came out of um, the same lab that I'm a proud of. But really this is kind of the, one of the first tools that, well, that kind of really integrated and leveraged kind of all these gene features, um, gene content and genomic features into kind of like a single tool in order to make this uh, a, a certain specific prediction confidence. Um, and so it uses these features and uses a probabilistic model. It basically said that, you know, do you have hallmark genes? Yes or no. Um, do you have an enrichment in viral genes as opposed to non-viral genes? Um, yes or no. And then kind of those secondary metrics like um, short gene strand switching. And it basically added those up, um, applied a probabilistic model, which I won't go into, to basically come up with different confidence categories in descending order of confidence. So, you know, confident category one, for example, for virus order, at least virus order one that was published in 2015. If you have category one, then you're almost definitely a virus. If you're category two, you're mostly probably confidently a virus. If you're category three, then, eh, you know, I don't know. It's probably a lot of microbial junk in there, short pieces, fragments. Um, I would definitely look more into those. So if you had an automated uh, methodology, you might choose one and two um, as opposed to three. Um, Virus Auto 2 came out just this year. Um, so I don't have too much kind of data on that. Clearly it's the most late, recent um, of the virus identification classification, uh, identification tools. So it, you know, later tools, more recent tools tend to be more accurate than, you know, the earlier tools, clearly. Um, and it uses all the same features and then some. It, I think it doubles the number of features used um, to make a prediction. And then it uses a multiple machine learning classification um, algorithm in order to, you know, make its predictions. Um, it is, did I put that here? No. It is um, arguably superior to most, if not all the other tools that are currently available at the moment. Um, but um, this tool is so new that, oh, actually, I think I say it, it, it's still so new that it's not even in Kbase yet. Um, it takes a little bit longer to put tools in Kbase. So the other tool is Marvel. This came out a couple of years after, um, a year, maybe two years, I forget. Um, a couple of years after Fear Sorter 1 did. And it uses many of the same features that Fear Sorter 1 did, but instead they applied machine learning. And they had more of a, like a genome bin mag identification um, slant to their um, publication. But they used many of the same features and um, they got um, a better performance in some aspects. I think the sensitivity was a little bit better um, than um, Virasota was or Virafinder was. Um, and so at the time, you know, Marvel and Virasota um, 
basically have, since they use this, mainly the same features and one uses statistical methods and the other one machine learning, they basically get the same kind of results. Um, in our lab, or at least in my hands, um, you know, Marvel gets a few more, but some of those might be more false positives and Virasorter might get a few less, but there's fewer false positives. So, you know, in the end, you kind of get the same, um, the same context out. And then finally, um, actually this tool uses camera frequencies in machine learning, it's called Deep Viewfinder. Um, and um, it's, its basic thing is that instead of using, you know, those gene content and genomic features, it uses the actual frequencies of short regions of the genome. So um, they basically used a viral data set um, chopped up it into small cameras. I think they were like 150, 200, 250, and basically applied a machine learning algorithm to see, um, okay, what does what do these 150 MERS look like in the viral data set to compare them to what 150 MER looks like in a microbial data set? Um, and, you know, behold, it actually worked. Um, actually, I probably should have put a, um, another figure in here, um, but actually it worked um, pretty well. Um, and one of the great things about Deep Viewfinder is that since the cameras are so short, it's able to identify viruses in much, in much smaller contexts. So one of the negatives of using gene content and features is that you need to have genes um, in order to um, make a prediction. You need to have like three, four, five genes in order to have enough for the algorithms to make your prediction. Um, not so with Deep Viewfinder. And in fact, you can have like one to 1.5 KB genomes um, that can have a very high confident um, hit. And that when we look into that data set, you find that, hey, there's like one hallmark, viral hallmark gene and maybe you know, an unknown um, um, uh, gene that could be, um, you know, some other feature of that virus, or so to speak. Um, and so that's too small for Marvel and Viresor to identify, but it's not too small for Deep Viewfinder. And so I often use Deep Viewfinder to help me get a lot of the smaller genomes um, in a data set. But once you start getting to like, you know, 10 KB, I should actually put this someplace. Once you start getting to something around like 10 KB, um, a lot of the um, like view finder, uh, view sorter and Marvel based methodologies um, perform at least as good, if not superior to the camera based um, frequency approaches. Um, so view sorter one, um, is available on Cybers, KBase, and there's an actual protocols.io for it. Viersorter 2 is only on Cybers, but we do have um, an SOP for using it on like HPCs on protocols. And then Marvel and Deep Viewfinder are both um, only available on Cybers. Um, and I wanted to put this slide in here. I know you're not supposed to put charts in here and tables, um, tables and papers, but I just wanted to just briefly mention the fact that each one of these tools have different thresholds for quality. And so if you have a high quality genome for Deep Viewfinder, that's not gonna use the same scale as Marvel or Viewsorter. Um, and th these are basically the thresholds that in the Sullivan lab, we've kind of mostly agreed with um, that these are kind of the thresholds that you'd wanna use for each one of these um, um, various viral identification tools. Um, for Deep Viewfinder and Viewsorter, you want at least you know, 1.5 KB. And for Viewsorter, it needs to be circular um, or 5 KB and greater otherwise. Um, and Marvel can go a little bit lower. Um, I wouldn't trust too much below 5 KB, um, but you, know, the, you can find stuff 2 KB and higher. Um, some of these are the benefits. Mint, no, most of them are easy to use. Viewsorter is really nice because it has clear categories that you can just, I want one and two. Or I want four and five. Um, Deep Fear Finder can actually be hard. Uh, Deep Fear Finder and Marvel can be a little harder to use because they have a, like a sliding scale of not just confidence, but like 
um, um, not just p-values, but also um, scores. And so you can have actually very high scoring deep verified contigs that actually can be false positives. Um, so what we try to do in the lab is actually use more than just one ident viral identification tool. So you can use like a super high confident viral um, deep verified call and you can you can say, hey, I just need one of these. You know, I just need deep finder. I just need view sorter. But if you start using the medium quality, or maybe you have some high qualities that look a little iffy, um, then you might want to use multiple methods. Um, and that's kind of how we've proceeded is that, you know, you could use view sorter, deep view finder, and Marvel, or, you know, have, if they all three agree, or at least two of those three agree, then great, go ahead and use them. Okay, so for the next part, and I'm a little running behind time, um, are basically a bunch of after you've done your viral identification, what can you do? What can you do with that? Um, and the first thing you want to do is get rid of those duplicate sequences. And let's go back to that UVIX paper. Um, and they have a recommendation of 95% ANI over 85% of the aligned fraction. So aligned fraction is basically you have um, two genomes and the shorter genome covers 85% the length of the longer genome. Um, so you can use that kind of as your threshold for clustering your sequences together. We have two tools um, that are available both in Cyverse. Um, we have cluster genomes. I'm terrible at naming things. Um, it uses a bunch of in-house scripts um, powered by Nukmer to basically do an all versus all comparison and then goes through those alignments and filters them um, at 95% um, over 80% ANI. Um, and the reason for this is that the UVIC papers came out after we published the cluster genome stuff. Um, and so that's what we went with. And my personal experience, um, 80 to 85% length. So like once you've hit, I'm gonna say this in the next section, but once you've hit like 60 or 70% aligned fraction, um, you know, it's unlikely um, that the rest of it will be totally different, such that you, you wouldn't be able to maintain the 95% ANI. And then DREP, DREP is actually something that was mentioned in the, um, um, in the MAG um, um, section portion. Um, that is a published paper. Cluster genomes isn't like really a published method paper. Um, but it has a variety of different algorithms that you can use. And they also recommend, at least for microbial genomes, 95% um, ANI over 80% length. Um, in fact, the authors themselves discuss the fact that when they're actually handling sequence data themselves, they can go all the way down to 60% um, because, um, and you know, that's kind of my experience too. It's that if you have an ANI that high, you either have like, five or 10% of the genome aligning, or you have like 80 to 90% of it aligning. So you've already, you know, you're either definitely not gonna make it or you're definitely going to make it. Um, and so, you know, if you wanna follow the UVIX, go 85. If you wanna follow just, you know, this, this is really probably good enough, I would go with 80%. Um, you probably won't see much of a difference. Um, I like to just go 80% just historical reasons. After you do that, you want to use check V. Um, check V is like check M, um, but it's for viruses. <laughs> um, um, it, it does a number of really, really nice features. And until like oh God, one, two years ago, it was like the Wild West. Um, you know, you'd get the quality was purely assigned based on what the um, confidence category was. Um, of the identification tools. Um, we had like, what's the quality? And you're like, oh, I don't know, it's a category one on view sorter. Um, it's it's gotta be high quality, you know? Um, high, it's high confidence. It's not necessarily high quality. Um, and so check fee came in to save the day and it uses um, various HMM databases to um, identify where in the genome you have HMM hits to microbial data sets and or uh, databases and viral HMM hits to um, viral databases. 
Um, and it uses that to basically figure out where the breakpoint is between viruses and hosts. Now, this isn't perfect, um, but it does do a much better job than almost any of the other tools out there. Unless you're a specialized tool to you know, delimit the host versus virus boundary, um, this is you know, probably as good as you're gonna get um, quickly. So it removes host contamination. It estimates genome completeness using um, HMMs um, and um, the various you know, genomes that you do hit against. So let's say you have a virus that has 10 virus viral genes that we know are viruses and your unknown genome hits nine of those 10. Now, um, you know, your, I don't wanna say gut instinct, but the feeling would be like, those are very similar. They're probably the same virus. Um, it's unlikely it's, you know, some, um, some you know, rare variant of it or something in a totally different, you know, domain of life. And so you likely have 90% completion because you have uh, nine out of those 10 genes, so to speak. Um, and so you can use that in order to estimate how complete your genome is. And that's what CheckFee does. And I won't go into like kind of how it assigns those confidence values because um, it can get kind of um, crazy. Uh, it also estimates closed ends, generally using repeats, um, either direct um, repeats or inverted. Um, and this is kind of like a virus um, life cycle, um, often a packaging strategy um, that viruses use or employ um, in order to, you know, go through their viral life cycle. And if your assembler hasn't been judicious and trimmed off those repeats, because um, the Bruin graphs are notorious for removing repeats and, or not being able to assemble them. And so they put them as like a, a separate content that has just like one repeat or one repeat unit. Um, uh, Check V um, can use those to identify um, closed ends of your genome and say, hey, um, not only is your genome complete, but we're pretty confident that it's a closed genome. And then finally, it can summarize the quality um, using the UVIG standards. Um, this came out after the UVIG standards were published, and um, met several of the people have worked on CheckFee, I think, on the UVIG or work with uh, many of the UVIG office. So there's, you know, there's historical reasons for that, I suppose. Um, and Check V is available as a beta app on Cyverse and I think should be coming online on Keybase. Should already be online. I can't remember. I think it's at least a beta app. Um, it's at least a beta app. And then finally, something else that people would like to do is estimate um, read mapping, uh, estimate read estimate viral abundance using read mapping techniques. And so the thought here is um, very similar to um, the microbial side in that if you have um, a bunch of genomes, um, you know, in various data sets, if you map reads from each of those data sets onto those genomes, you should have some relative abundance estimates as long as your amplification strategy wasn't, you know, overly biased. Like, you know, maybe is like MDA, where you get, you know, an over abundance of short, you know, single stranded circular genomes or something. So um, yeah, you can use read mapping techniques in order to identify the presence of a particular virus in a particular sample. And that benchmarking paper that I discussed earlier also did this for read mapping, basically asking the question, um, at what level do I need to map against a genome in order to have confidence that that genome is present in that sample? And I won't bore you um, with the details, but basically they identified at least 75% identity um, and 80% genome coverage. So if you have at least 75% identity um, of the, the, the read against that contig, the genome, and then at least 80% of it covered, you can say with some degree of confidence that that virus is present. Um, the ANI for this is probably gonna be um, a, bit, a bit higher 
in the actual data set, because as you can see, um, once you hit that kind of 75% identity threshold, you're going to hit, you know, you're only going to really be hitting the genomes that you're interested in. And if you're really concerned about, you know, I want my specific read to map to a specific VOTU, or I want it to be mapping at the, you know, the strain level, um, you're really going to have to hit something higher than 95% A and I, maybe I should have probably written this down too. Um, at least 97%. But I think once you start hitting 97 plus percent, 97 to 98, um, in my opinion, um, you're really starting to hit the limits of what the assemblers are capable of assembling at, um, unless you're doing some really fancy stuff. Um, and you really probably can't align it higher than like 98 or 99%, unless you're doing some very specific work, like uh, SNP work or something like that. There are two tools um, that you can use that are available. There's um, Bowtie Batch and Read to Ref Mapper. Yes, you can. You know who, who made those. Um, basically, that's um, a way of automating this entire process on Cyverse. So if you have one data set and you have like 50 metagenomes and you want to align those, um, this automates that entire process for you. Um, it basically runs Bowtie 2 um, on a number of different data sets, and it parses the results of that um, mass um, uh, read alignment process with read to ref mapper, because it's read to reference mapper. Um, and then you don't get a pretty figure, a figure this pretty, but um, you do get a figure that looks very much like this. Um, it's going to have like, you know, if you run 50 of them, maybe you'll have 50 sequences here. Um, but you can, next week we'll go through and you can take um, the results from the, the um, from Cyverse and then plug it into R or something like that or Python and make a chart this beautiful as well. And then we also have cover M. Um, that actually, weirdly enough, um, is by the authors that use something that we use internally in read to ref mapper. Um, they updated that internal tool and made it kind of bigger and better. Um, and moving forward, I would definitely recommend Cover M, maybe over Bowtie Batch and read to ref mapper. Cover M is a little bit easier to use and has even more documentation than uh, read to ref mapper does. Um, there is one caveat to using cover M that you have to consider and that you need to adjust for the scale of the data sets that you're using. So if you have one data set that has 10 megabases and another that is 100 megabases, cover M doesn't really take that into account um, so that you could get a comparison that compares all of these different data sets. Um, that I believe has a beta app on Kbase. Um, I don't know if it's released yet either, um, because when I look at all the KBase apps, I always look at um, all of the apps available, not just like the released ones. And then finally, um, the last two tools are vContact2, um, which basically allows you to taxonomically classify your viruses. And this is kind of a super important um, tool that um, is kind of the, one of the first of its kind in order to get this like um, classification level. And um, it uses a gene sharing network that I will not go into because that's like a, a multi-hour course, um, but it uses these in order to get genus level taxonomy. Um, and um, we've kind of shown pretty confidently that these genus levels, um, that you, know, you can very quickly and easily get this um, genus level grouping, which is you know, grouping these VOTUs together into more appropriate like virus, um, viral clusters um, that are approximately at that level. Um, let's see, do I have anything else on that? Um, yeah, so I didn't want to spend too long because if I talk about this, I, I do spend too long on it. And so um, you can use this for very large scale data sets. This was a couple of years ago. And so there's 17,000 contigs in this figure here. And um, vContact2 is able to, you know, accurately um, and quickly classify a large portion of those. 
This is actually RefSeq in red, and um, the environmental data sets are all this um, kind of gray stuff. And in the paper, we basically show that the kind of the structure of this network really doesn't change as you add more data to it, um, which was actually pretty incredible finding. Um, so yeah, that's available on TKBase and Cyverse. Um, and we'll definitely be going over that in a little bit more detail next week. And then I think this is the final tool, DRAM V. We actually talked about DRAM last week. Um, and so I won't belabor the point, but um, actually two weeks ago, I always, I always feel like they went last week. Um, so this is basically DRAM for viruses. Um, it uses like, it, this is DRAM, it's the same authors. Um, it's just a subset of that tool. And it runs with um, the same databases as DRAM does, but it adds viral data bases as well in order to make those predictions. It gives far more detailed annotations than almost any of the tools, else, other tools that you could find. Um, and it also gives you that metabolic context, which you're missing from a lot of viral ecology research. And so if you're studying AMGs, auxiliary metabolic genes, and you wanna know how viruses can kind of supercharge um, the microbes that they infect, um, you would like to know metabolically how they might do that. And DRAM V offers an opportunity, like maybe the first opportunity to really look at that in an automated fashion. Um, for a number of years, people have talked about AMGs, but they haven't really um, focused on that. Um, focused on like an automated method to do that. Um, and this tool is available on um, both Cyverse um, and Kbase. Um, I think we'll, yeah, I think it's more, um, I think it's a released app on Kbase now. Oh yeah, and this is the final tool. So um, VMatch was a tool to basically identify virus host relationships. Um, it's an unpublished tool, but the methodology has actually been used in a recent gut viral database paper where they were able to um, assign about 50% of 33,000 in what they call it a viral populations, but they should be more appropriately called viral OTUs. Um, they were able to successfully classify about 50% of them. Um, and I shouldn't say what with 100% confidence because it's all like environmental data, sequence data, so they don't actually have like the specific hosts in culture. Um, but it uses a variety of different tools. Um, it uses host CRISPR spacers, um, prophage regions, so that's probably maybe 100% confidence. Um, host tRNA genes and chemo sigma signatures provided by WISH, which is another tool which I haven't really discussed. Um, and um, unlike a lot of other virus host um, tools, it doesn't use just one of those or two of those to make its predictions. And there are a couple of one other tool that basically uses many of them um, and just kind of gives you those results, but it doesn't weight them like Fear Matcher does um, because each one of these tools has a different level of confidence. You know, if, if you have, you know, maybe an integrated prophage, then you have like a strain or species level confidence. But if you have a chemo signature, only a chemo signature, maybe you only have confidence that the genus level or maybe the family level for the microbe. Um, and you don't want to really put strain level confidence with, you know, uh, family level confidence. You don't want to weight them equally. Um, and so um, what Viometry does is it has different, you know, weighting, scaling to each one of those um, um, tools. And, you know, it, it does a actually really good job for doing, uh, of doing that. And this tool is available on Keybase. Um, so I think, think that's it. Okay, so next week, um, if you wanna sign up for Keybase or Cyverse, go ahead and do that. If you wanna just like watch, um, that is totally fine. Um, I will be processing a, um, an SRA data set in Cyverse and Keybase um, end to end. Um, I think I'll do two halves so that it's just more clearly delimited. Um, um, instead of just like switching between the two of them, um, I'm still not sure. I think it'd be easier just to do one after the other. So with that, I went five minutes over. I was hoping to be five minutes, 10 minutes under, but um, I would like to thank you for your time um, and listening to kind of the best topic, 
I think of uh, the whole the whole series. At least we have two we have two whole weeks for this, so um, we can definitely go into more details next week. And um, with that, um, I will stop screen sharing and then I'll answer. I think these two lingering questions. I don't want to take too long. Um, okay, so the first question is um, still new to this field. Just curious question: How do we know whether the context that were assembled from short reads are actually viral genes and not artifacts? Um, does the burden lay more on the downstream analyses? Um, but do we know where there's a lot of hypothetical genes? How do we know that these could be real? Um, yeah, so I think this has to, um, this comes down to using various um, various lines of evidence to provide confidence for whether or not a, you know, are there actually viruses, uh, the actual virus. Mm -hmm. The only true way of doing this is identifying, um, is actually getting the host in culture. Um, that's, that's like the bona fide way of doing it. Um, if you don't have, the virus in the host and culture, then I would recommend having um, high confidences in multiple different using vi multiple different viral tools. So if you have high confidence in virus order one or two, high confidence in virus order, maybe high confidence in Marvel, um, and then sorry. you can actually sorry about that, and then you can actually look into um, the actual genomes themselves and see, hey, do we have a viral? Do we have these viral hallmark genes? and do the nature of Marvel and Virus Order. Um, if you do have those, um, those hallmark genes in there, you can have a lot of confidence. Um, and so other context, it's actually viral genomes. Yeah, so yeah, basically it's these um, downstream analyses like Virus Order um, that would give you, you know, confidence. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully that answers. Um, yes, yeah, there are a lot of hypothetical genes. Um, and in fact, you can, as I said before, you can actually use them um, against the viruses in order to identify them, because we know a lot more about microbial sequence space than we do viral. Um, so yeah. Okay. But if definitely follow up with me if you have any questions. Rationale for doing viral identification before do you uh, yeah, okay, that's a perfect, this is a perfect qu uh, question. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, I would probably, in the literature, people have done it both ways. Um, I just like viral identification uh, first, although I think I would agree with this assessment. Um, I generally do it first um, because the DU replication process and many of the data sets that I've worked with haven't really reduced that much. Um, in fact, maybe. You know, nowadays, I feel like when I'm doing um, analyses, I actually do do replication first, mainly to reduce the burden on um, the virus prediction and ident identification tools. So anonymous attendee, um, I might actually switch that up. Um, I don't do any dereplication on KBase for next week's thing, but I do do dereplication and that happens before. So I think my presentation is more out of order than what I um, typically do. Um, so yeah, this is a very good question. Um, you could do it before or after. Um, I would, in retrospect, probably do it beforehand just to reduce, yeah, like you said, the computational time to identify them. Um, yes. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, I won't go through any of the answered questions because many of the panelists here are just as much or maybe even more of an expert in some of these areas than I am. Um, okay, so yeah, I've gone 10 minutes over. So thank you so much for the people that are still here. Um, and I don't know if um, IDI, I don't think we have any more questions. So um, yeah, thank yeah, you think... again. 